So I'm very happy to, to introduce the, the first talk of the evening. Um, I've mentioned her name before, Harini Suresh, uh, who is a lead machine learning engineer and project manager at Omdena, which is a very interesting company uh, or organization. I, I hope Harini will introduce Omdena a little bit herself. Um, she joins us from India, which is in a very problematic uh, uh, situation right now. So we're uh, particularly fond that she's still here and healthy and, and we, uh, as the organizing team, wish her and the whole of India good luck to get through this catastrophe, which it really is very soon and very quick. But um, let's forget that for the evening and listen to Harini, who will uh, give you a fascinating talk now. Thank you, uh, Kay, and thank you for everyone at the organizing team for giving me this opportunity to talk here. And uh, I'm very glad to be here. As all of you mentioned that you're missing the on-site thing, I think only because it's online, I am able to present and meet all of you here. So it looks like it's an advantage for me. And uh, yes, I'm based out in India. Uh, I am a computer science engineering graduate, just uh, completed my engineering in 2019. And I have about uh, two years of work experience. I will complete two years of work experience in August. Uh, that's just about uh, me. But otherwise, I do. Uh, I work in an information networking field, uh, which is not related to AI or machine learning. But I've always had this interest and passion towards AI ML since my university days, because of which I uh, do it in the form of open source projects. I met uh, Camila, who introduced me to Kay here over uh, Women in AI Academy. So I volunteered a lot of organizations specific to ML projects, um, solving the real world problems, and uh, mainly for social causes and uh, economic causes. That's where I volunteer at. And Omdena is one such organization where I have been collaborating since a year. So I joined. Uh, Omdena last year, I mean, on 2020 May, and I've done about five projects with them. So the main thing is that uh, I've done like uh, NLP computer vision projects where I've been a lead machine learning engineer and um, also a project manager where I've kind of overseen the project and guided the team for the um, deliverables. So I, I worked on a handful of NLP projects. Apart from Omdena, I also volunteered at a lot of places where we used to use NLP to uh, mainly identify any uh, social causes which is related to safety, domestic violence, etc. So that's the main domain where I volunteer. So I work with Safe City and uh, Girls Tip Foundation, a lot of other organizations. So I just don't want to bore you guys with a lot of my own um, interactions. So what I can do is that um, we'll start presenting my screen and we'll give a brief introduction on what I would like to present and um, how we'll go about. Hope my screen is visible to everyone. All right, so yeah, uh, the main purpose as to of today's presentation or my talk as such is um, how we can apply natural language uh, processing to solve real world problems. It, it, of course, that all of us are working on um, in real world. We are working with real world and we are trying to apply NLP in, the, in a lot of departments, starting from customer engineering to software engineering. We apply NLP, but uh, the way that I would like to talk about is the bridging between real world problems with NLP is the actual real world problem in terms of uh, non technical assistance. So, when we have, uh, whenever we talk about, uh, say, customer engineering or software engineering, all of us know that uh, it's, uh, it's quite obvious that we will have the data with us. So when we work in a company of uh, customer engineering and we want to analyze some data using NLP, of course, we are going to have the data. The main problem with solving real world problems using NLP is like we have two main problems. The first one would, of course, be data scarcity or sparsity, because in general, your problems wouldn't have uh, that much data. 
um, the second one is the structuring of the data. So when we talk about, there's one special case study that I would, um, I would be giving a talk on during this entire period. So when we look at that case study as such, we will see that we actually do not have uh, any data. So how we arrived at a position where we were able to build a model and how it helps is what we will be looking at a, a future way. So uh, my case study is going to be to see how we applied AI slash NLP to analyze domestic violence during COVID-19 in India. So, um, right. so the problem as such is that uh, all of us were very aware that uh, during the time of COVID-19, we did see a marked increase in the number of cases of domestic violence, online harassment, and yeah, of course, a lot of such things which are taking place. We don't have like, um, say, uh, all of us as such will know that there had been an increase in the number of cases. How do we know is uh, we hear it uh, from someone, we look into Twitter, we see Facebook, things like that. But the, the main challenge over here is that um, we don't have any proper data for the same. By proper data, what I mean is that uh, we, whenever we look into solving such issues, we need to perform an analysis. So right now, it's just by words and everything that all of us knew that hey, uh, domestic violence has increased across uh, India during COVID-19, yeah? But how do we actually analyze and how do we prove it and share it with the respective authorities so they can take action accordingly? That's the challenge that we have to solve. And the challenge was that incidents reported were mostly via calls. So in India, uh, during this phase of COVID-19, what happened was no one actually reported the cases as in, we don't have any data. So most of the cases that were reported from different cities, towns. So in India, we have the three types of um, areas, I would say we would have like towns, cities, and metropolitan cities. So from towns or villages, we wouldn't have act anyone actually um, right, like coming coming out and saying that, hey, so this is what I'm facing, putting it out there in social media or anything. For them, it is just that they report the problems via phone call to the police. But again, when they do that, we don't get to collect a lot of information because most of them are private and uh, we don't get information from them. One thing is that we can get information from the police authorities in case of uh, see the number of cases, but of course we wouldn't get the data that we are talking about here. So that was the main challenge. So we had to perform like a data mining and analysis regarding an increase in the cases, uh, the domestic violence and the online harassment cases. So first part was the data mining because we did not have the data. And the second one was the qualitative analysis. So, uh, we used NLP in both the categories. So even while mining data, we had used NLP in stage one, I would call it a stage one NLP. The second one is stage two NLP for qualitative analysis. And I can of course like describe about it further. So just to give a brief on the, pro on the case study or the project as such, like I mentioned, we did not have enough, we, we did not have data and that's the whole challenge. So. What we try to do is we try to find out if there are any public sources available from where we could mine data, uh, of, of course, which is relevant to domestic violence or online harassment. So that way, there's like uh, two primary things which came up to our mind. One was the data from the newspapers and the other one was the data from social media. So the data from newspapers, how did they, uh, how did we come up with that idea was in India, maybe like uh, we get like an average number of cases. We do not get a return format of every case in newspapers unless it's very serious or unless it's out in the open. Otherwise, we only get to uh, have the numbers as in like three K cases were reported in a city, things like that. That is how we used to get. So we targeted newspapers first. Uh, in the terms of newspapers, since India is a country to Diverse culture and diverse languages, we chose both regional 
and non-regional newspapers. So we had like uh, regional newspapers ranging from a different ranging from different languages, and we had also chosen uh, English newspaper. So that was the whole um, target. That's all about newspapers. When we came to social media, we were quite aware that some people do show their stress or uh, they just exhibit what they were going through via Twitter or any social media platform like Instagram, things like that. For so the same, we read it. Reddit was also one such platform. So we targeted social media. And unfortunately, we were not able to collect data from Instagram because of the privacy policies, but we were able to from Twitter and uh, Reddit. And there were two other major sources of data that uh, we came up with is so Google Trends. And the fourth one is government data. Government data is a very uh, credible one because uh, we have the government logistics. The government of India gives logistics on what are the number of cases impacted, what is happening around the uh, around India in terms of harassment, etc. So that's credible. But uh, when we look at the Google Trends, Google Trends was taken as a supportive measure for the analysis that we do using NLP. We wanted a support because we, we do not have any validation for the modeling that we were doing since all the data is unstructured and we were just trying to structure it, work on that. So we tried using Google Trends. And in case of Google Trends, it was a supportive data set in such a way that we took the words, the keywords like help, uh, yeah, so words like uh, help and locked. So there were certain words uh, which we searched, like how much it is trending. What's the variant that it's trending? And with that, we were able to see if our analysis is being supported by Google Trends or not. So Google Trends, I would say, is not um, a data source providing thing, but it's more with one that we chose to support our validations that we need. Uh, yes, so this was their entire pipeline as such. So in this, uh, we there is kind of a, uh, for the projects that I worked with, a lot of projects, the models are quite easy to build, but the data is the challenging part. In most of the projects that I worked with, maybe it's related to a cost, a cost specific one. It's for a social cause or because it's more of real real world data. It's the, we, we feel that um, building the data is a challenging part. The so same in this project. So we chose to build the data, go through pre-processing, and then we build a model. So the first, uh, how we went through the pipeline was we, choose the, we chose the source. For that, again, we went through everything. We also looked at a lot of uh, YouTube videos. It's very common that sometimes people share uh, YouTube videos of harassment or domestic violence in the internet. So we were checking out to see if there are any YouTube videos out there. But um, unfortunately, YouTube videos do not provide us much of information. So we do not choose the source. Apart from that, we had uh, rest of the other things like um, I mentioned before, Reddit, Twitter, all of them. Twitter is a platform uh, via which we can actually scrape data using their publicly available APIs. So that's how we collected Twitter data. And newspaper data, of course, we have a lot of uh, APIs from which we can mine the data. And then we pre-process it, check for validity, and did annotations. So moving further, I will discuss more about it, uh, but this is an overview. So the thing is, uh, one major point when I say we were mining the data or we were actually checking for the data, people might be confused at what data are we actually talking about. Like, uh, where is the data from? Uh, right? Because newspapers or Twitter is going to have a lot of data. So how are we going to get the data which is explicit only to the COVID-19 period from India and is related to domestic violence and sexual harassment? So for this, we used a bit of mechanics like um, keywords. So the main thing is keywords. This is what we did. These are the uh, words that we use. So we got a set of keywords, which is related to the uh, domestic violence and online harassment. So we were trying to mine or scrape the data from all the sources available using these keywords. Not just this, 
we also restricted our um, uh, mining and uh, collection of data only with uh, we also restricted this only for a certain period that is from the period of jan to may 2020 in india so this is the period that we restricted our um, access to and from where we actually got the data now another challenge that we got up with the data collection from different sources where one thing that we have to accept is uh, in india we have the rural and urban areas like i said the three the three phases we have the villages the towns the cities and the metropolitan cities so for metropolitan cities we have twitter where people share it via twitter and a lot of things for villages it's mostly with the government records and from the newspapers so whenever it becomes a serious issue it comes out in the newspapers so there was like an imbalanced data set which is created if you could see here uh, the major three sources, the major two sources, and the Google Trends is like a support, validation supporter one. If we look at the newspaper, it says a 26-year-old woman uh, lodged a complaint. So it is in the form of a proper sentence. So if we see, it's more with uh, a, just a normal sentence where one can understand and read it. What happened? What, what We can get a lot of information from there. But if we look at the Twitter data, it is absolutely in a different format. When we search with domestic uh, violence or abuse, yeah, we get even such kind of data or lines, which makes it a bit difficult to, uh, the way that we actually try to combine everything into a single clean data set. This space is about uh, data preparation. So in this, what we did was, uh, as we told earlier, we do not have any validation data set. We chose to go with supervised learning model in NLP, mainly because as a follow-up of the project, the partner with whom we were doing the project wanted to actually uh, provide impact. So they wanted to actually, it, it, they wanted to do something after the challenge that's useful to the society. So they wanted to follow up with uh, certain authorities or uh, some authorities who are located in certain villages, towns, to actually see how they can help the domestic violence victims or the survivors. So we did not want to take a chance with the unsupervised learning model. Therefore, we went ahead with the supervised learning model. But again, for the supervised learning model, the biggest challenge that was faced is they are all unstructured data and they're completely unlabeled. We do not have any kind of, uh, we do not have like uh, any kind of validation data set. So we came up to prepare our own annotations. So by our own annotations, it means that um, we just prepare the data in such a way that with all the data that we collected, all the data sources, be it um, Twitter, be it news. Now this one that is visible on my screen is for Twitter. So what we did was actually we collected data from Twitter and we labeled them. We had guidelines. So sometimes what happens is in Twitter, there can be news, there can be opinion. So some people might share their opinion, like, hey, uh, DV, domestic violence is increasing in India. Some people might say that, uh, hey, yeah, we've seen like a trend. And all of them are, are just like opinion and it's not the incident. So we had different labels. So we could actually differentiate which is the exact situation, what data we are supposed to analyze from what's like an information. And this is the uh, second part of the pipeline. So the first part of what we did was the one that I showed before, the Twitter platform where we tried to label. So as a part of the labeling process, we were able to uh, build, a, build a data set, which has like the sentence, so it has a sentence like, uh, so I was uh, just abused uh, in the morning. So that's the sentence. Then we have the label called as domestic violence, DV. So we assign labels manually out of the 8K uh, lines of data. So I would say 8K articles, 8,000 articles or 8,000 uh, lines of uh, data set that we collected. We annotated about 5,000 articles using a Docano tool. We have a tool for it, we use Docano. After that was completed, the second step 
was to uh, build a model for that. So using that, we used uh, we used that to build a classifier. And in this case, we actually had a lot of uh, classifiers in mind. So the best approach that we could come up with that to see the we uh, the way we used is that we tried to use two approaches. The first one is though we used words that is related to domestic violence and uh, women, all that, we got a lot of unnecessary things which is not related to domestic violence. We used a certain sort of keywords to mine data, but still we were not able to get what we uh, actually wanted. We were not able to get the uh, exact output. Sometimes it gave out, it gave uh, it, it, even the news channels, like for example, even the movie news, even that came under this because of the word women. So we wanted to filter all that. So as a first step, we used an unsupervised learning technique called um, LDA or LSA where we give the number of topics. So I just gave the number of topics to be four or five. And the algorithm works in such a way that it tries to find out the most occurring words. So for example, if we give five topics, it will see it forms clusters of five. It forms five clusters and tries to put all the articles into those five. And the way it chooses is like the maximum uh, occurring words. So for example, if violence occurs a lot of time, the violence will be one cluster and all the articles related to violence will be there. So that way, we were able to filter out the unnecessary ones. So when you give n is equal to five, when you give five clusters, it gives you like um, five topics as such. So one could be women, one could be violence, all that. When you give n is equal to 10, it splits further into different categories. That way, we can try to just uh, leave the or leave behind the unnecessary topics that we don't want to actually. So that's like the first part where we built a super unsupervised learning model so we could further filter out. And then after that, we built a proper supervised classifier model using the label data set that we prepared. Uh, to further classify into labels, if it is actually domestic violence, or if it is online harassment, or if it is information, or if it is an incident. So once we completed that, after labeling, and we know which is domestic violence, which is online harassment, which is a news, the second step was uh, to perform a qualitative analysis. This is what we try to get out of the qualitative analysis. The slide that we are looking at now currently is for the, we used these labels for news articles. These labels were used for Twitter articles and these labels were used for newspaper articles because uh, the data is very much different. In Twitter, we will have opinions, but in newspaper, we are going to have opinions. It's just the news, what has happened. So we had different labels over here. So we want to see if it was an online harassment. And um, we have the very infamous Nirbhaya case, which happened in India in 2012. The verdict was given last year during the COVID time. So there were a lot of news pertaining to that uh, Nirbhaya case. So for that, we had actually tagged them as case progress. So these are the tags that are related to the newspaper articles. Now, after we prepare these tags, we wanted to perform a data analysis. The main purpose of data analysis uh, was to see if COVID was actually the reason for rising domestic violence. If yes, then why? So COVID-19, uh, you can have multiple reasons. One is that the unemployability rate increased because of the lockdown. And uh, because, uh, maybe that caused stress and people lost their jobs and maybe that uh, caused domestic violence. Or was it like the money? Or what, what was the exact reason? as to why all this was caused. That was the analysis that we had to do. And we had a, we had to mine a few supporting factors as well. So the first part was for us to um, identify like what are the features that we were supposed to gain out of the analysis. And the features that we see on the slide are those features. The, our partner organization wanted to understand the relationship um, between the actor and the survivor 
we don't call them victim we just call them survivor to see what is the relationship they share in most of the cases so that was one and um, the second one was circumstance circumstance was under what circumstance did it happen was it like a heated argument with the husband slap the wife or was it like uh, why what is the situation which led to this was it the case of dowry or was it like any petty reason things like that that came under circumstance and then we have violence verb where we try to see if uh, what was the exact violence thing that was happening was it a slap or was it uh, a murder or was it an acid attack what kind of violence actually took place and then we have the age of the actor age of the survivor the gender of the actor gender of the survivor and the medium of violence the medium of violence exclusively only for online harassment just to see which social medium is uh, uh, the people tend to use more for the violence so if you can see the left hand part this is the circumstance that uh, we came up with a representation and again this data is was not labeled so we had the data and we had to get all these features from it we wanted to apply um, algorithm called as named entity recognition using conditional random field the reason we came up with that algorithm was because it was feature selection we had to mine features entities and we used conditional random field so that it satisfies a few conditions and gives us the output so conditional random field works in such a way that uh, it looks at your uh, if the word is like the husband killed the wife if the word is looking for is killed it will look what comes before killed and it will look what comes after killed so it's based on the, based on the condition based on the word position is what it determines if that feature has to be selected or not and because uh, for this one we had like a subject and like a verb what was happening subject verb agreement we wanted to actually use ner using crf model but we didn't have the labels for it was a supervised learning model so we again annotated about 4k to 5k data to see who is the circumstance violence verb and then we trained the model accordingly this is what we did and uh, out of the analysis that we pro- performed using the model we were able to see that um, there were many cases like heated argument and uh, alcohol and cases of covid of course the unemployability rate co- caused this problem and because of which covid caused unemployability and because of which the domestic violence cases increased and there was one more category of uh, petty reason where um, the wife actually wins the husband over a small uh, computer game or like a mobile game called as ludo and because of that the husband kills the wife so all these were coming under petty reasons and we handed this over to the uh, authorities to see what can be done so we did not know the reason why it was okay. just given that uh, the guy won the ludo the girl won the ludo game and so the husband killed her but we don't know what else was behind it this was the analysis that we uh, performed and this is what we looked more into the time of the the time and the place of the day when it occurred most of the times we were not able to decode that because that was a very big challenge since time and day did not the day was fine in many of the cases the day is just explicitly mentioned if it's thursday or uh, or when is it things like that sorry the the day like the if it's morning afternoon or evening but the time was um, it was difficult to map since it was case by case basis some people mentioned it like they did not use the redundant words like afternoon evening night there were some complex words uh, used in the case like um, after studies uh, there it was not straight forward so we found some difficulty in getting in finding a pattern for time and place and thereby we we ignored it but rest we were able to find everything else and violence verb was a very the violence verb was a very um a very common or very easy feature to mine mainly because it is verb related so we can say that this guy performed it, it was an act of performance so this did not require us to annotate but a simple script to actually find the verb in the entire sentence helped us so the way like uh, the act to kill the wife so kill would be the verb that way we were able to do it just 
providing a summary our uh, main focus on the entire project was to do a qualitative analysis apart from data collection and apart from classification and in that way the named entity recognition model actually helped us so that would i would say that that's the best model any are using crf was the best model that we came up with mainly because of the conditions and the fields the values that it generated because in such sentences we should know who is the actor and who is the survivor and what was the word between them and crf model best suited that and uh, yes yeah, so i'm be, i'm pressing this behalf on all our uh, collaborators so this is not me who worked on the project we were a team of around 40 to 50 collaborators so i'm just uh, trying to uh, you know like thank all of them here and uh, one more thing that i would like to specify is at the end of the challenge of the project we handed over all the collected data so we had a lot of data which is collected from twitter news and everything we organized them and we handed over them to the respective partner and also the model so they could use the same model in uh, they use the same model running for the rest of the covid period so we did this in may so they used the same model to write after me and also used it so they can move to the this project to actually create an impact in india where uh, our partner was red dot foundation they are a women's uh, safety uh, organization so the ceo of red dot foundation moved a case in the supreme court of india to propose domestic violence in the national uh, law so that the entire proceed proceedings over there was based on um, the project that we actually performed so that is the impact that the project created and about the organization as such as um, k mentioned i have been associated with it for a year like i'll, I'll complete a year in may we are like uh, we have a lot of projects as such impacting projects most of them are socially impacting projects and solving real world problems they range from social problems to economic problems and to a lot of problems and we have the partner organizations like red dot foundation the united nations we have united nations we have human rights first and uh, we do have solar ng projects like that where people work on computer vision the project goes for around 2 months and uh, we'll have like a team we have 40 to 50 people working on it so it's like all of them are on the same board and trying to solve a challenge we come together and that's how we uh, try to solve the challenge we don't we completely follow a bottom up collaboration method so once i joined umbrellas when i got exposure to so many models and networking via which um, yeah we i learned a few things so that's about my organization too Okay, so we hope everyone's back. Uh, thanks again to Arini for our first talk, and now I'm excited to introduce our second talk of the evening. Um, I'd like to introduce our second talk with a few remarks um, that kind of tie into this discussion and this research. So maybe we can keep those in mind for um, the discussion later on as well. Um, I feel like we've all observed that there's a bit of a monopoly with large, multi-trillion parameter language models. So you've got your Google, your Nvidia, your Microsoft, um, and your OpenAI, of course. GPT-3, for instance, is only accessible via paid API, as far as I can tell, for commercial use. So there's two main questions that arise from that. So how do we compete? How do smaller NLP teams compete with that, or NLP researchers? with the results of those models produced and how much processing time and computational power and as a result energy usage is really needed to solve nlp tasks efficiently or can we find a smarter way to train our models and the headline for our second talk is 99.9% fewer parameters and better performance than gpt3 on supergroup and now i'm excited to hand it off to timo shik who will be um taking us through a tour of um yeah a novel training method and show us how that was achieved yeah thanks for the uh 
kind introduction. Hello also from, from my side and welcome to this second talk uh, where we will discuss a better approach to future learning and we will see how a GPT-3 can be outperformed by combining task descriptions with supervised learning. Uh, before we start, I'd like to say just a few words about myself. Um, I'm a data scientist at a company called Sulzer GmbH in Munich in Germany. Uh, where I've been working for the past four years, uh, mostly for customers in the automotive sector, and we tried to solve their uh, NLP uh, problems. Uh, besides, I'm also a PhD student at the Center for Information and Speech Processing at the LMU Munich, uh, and there I do mostly research on representation learning and on future learning, which is what this talk is going to be about. Um, and yeah, most of my inspiration comes from from my industry job. So I like to I like to get inspiration. I like to I like to see the problems that we face there, and and take them as a basis for my research. And of course, efficient future learning is one of those problems. All right, so uh, gets, uh, let's get right started. And I'd like to start with something very basic. I'd like to recap how we typically train NLP or machine learning models. We do so by providing them with examples, that is pairs of inputs and corresponding outputs. And we hope that based on those examples, they are able to pick up the underlying task. They are able to understand what problem we want them to solve. Uh, this works quite well if you have, let's say, thousands of examples available, uh, but it is exceedingly difficult in a few shot setting, not just for machine learning models, but also for humans, I think. To illustrate this, I've got a couple of examples on this slide here uh, of inputs on the left and corresponding outputs on the right. So, for example, we have this was the best pizza I've ever had with an output of zero. You can get better sushi for half the price with an output of one. And salmon digiri was bad, not worth what they're asking, again, with an output of one. Based on just those three examples, let's try to find the correct output for this fourth input here. Excellent pizza, slices are fantastic, reasonable prices. We can think about this for quite some while, um, but I think it's obvious that it is impossible to tell the single correct output for this input, uh, simply because there are plausible explanations for both zero and one. This is why if we actually wanted someone to solve this task, it would never occur to us to just throw a bunch of examples at them. What we would do instead is we would try to explain the task. We would provide some form of task description. So for example, we could say, based on their review, does the customer who wrote this text think that the restaurant is good, corresponding to an output of zero, or bad, corresponding to an output of one? And with this tiny bit of extra information, it becomes much easier for us to solve this task and assign the correct output. Now, if task descriptions are so helpful for us as humans, I think it's natural to ask whether we can also somehow provide those task descriptions to pre-trained language models. And at this point, I hope that you're all familiar with the uh, concept of masked language modeling or language modeling in general. Uh, just in case you are not, uh, this is something that is typically done in natural language processing, uh, where we pre-train a model by giving it texts from which we remove random words and then we train the model to predict or to reconstruct those missing words. This can be done on millions of examples because we don't need to label anything. We just need plain texts. Um, and of course, this gives the model much linguistic knowledge that is helpful for many tasks. So a pre-trained language model is able to fill in the blanks in, in closed questions. And one key idea for providing language models with task descriptions is to convert those task descriptions into closed questions. So for example, with this particular description here, we might instead say, excellent pizza, slices are fantastic, reasonable prices, the restaurant is masked. And then we can use a pre-trained language model to fill in this blank and compute the probability that it assigns to the words good and bad. Uh, in this way, we can provide a task description to a pre-trained language model. All right, so let's see how well this uh, works. Uh, if we give this particular in put to a pre-trained model, I think that's Roberta Large, uh, it outputs good with a probability of 99.8%. So this seems to work quite well. However, uh, 
as you probably know, current language models are far from having human-like text understanding, and so they can very easily be fooled. For example, if you say pizza tasted terrible, place was dirty, only the decoration was nice, uh, then Roberta still thinks that the correct output is good. On the other hand, if you try some other kind of task description, some other closed question, for example, if you say just mask, pizza tasted terrible, place was dirty, only the decoration was nice, uh, then Roberta again gets it correct. So this is supposed to illustrate two things. First of all, providing task descriptions to pre-trained language models can be very helpful. Uh, but second, it is by no means sufficient for obtaining good performance. And this is why in our research, we try to combine this idea of learning from descriptions with regular learning from examples. Okay, so uh, this already brings me to the outline for the rest of this talk. First of all, I'm going to introduce our method for combining task descriptions with example-based learning. We call this method Pattern Exploiting Training, or PET for short. Uh, then we are going to compare PET to priming, which is another future learning paradigm that was recently made popular by GPT-3. Uh, and finally, we're going to have an outlook. I'm going to talk about some recent research. Uh, and then, of course, we have time for a discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask during the talk. All right, so let's start with pattern exploiting training. Uh, when we designed this method, we had two key principles in mind. First, we wanted to combine task descriptions with learning from examples, as I've already said. And secondly, we wanted to allow for multiple different task descriptions, because it is very difficult to tell which descriptions are actually understood well by a pre-trained language model. And in a few shot setting, we don't have a large validation set to just try different descriptions. All right, with those principles in mind, how does pattern exploiting training work? Well, we start with an input just like before. And the first thing we do is we convert it into a closed question, for example, by appending it was mask. For this, we require something that we call a pattern, that is a function that maps an input to a closed question. And then we process this entire input with a masked language model, so we now get an output distribution for this masked position. But we are not interested in the entire output distribution. We are only interested in the scores assigned to a subset of words, in our case, the words good and bad. And for this, we require another component, something that we call a verbalizer. Uh, this is basically a mapping from all possible labels uh, to corresponding realizations in natural language. OK, so how can, we, how can we train this architecture if you have a couple of labeled examples? Well, that's actually fairly simple. Um, the first thing we do is we can convert our output distribution into a probability distribution using softmax. And then we can compare those soft labels with the actual desired output. Uh, we can compute some loss, let's say cross entropy loss, and then use this for reg regular gradient based optimization. OK, so this is how we can um, approach our problem if we have just one task description. But what if we can think of multiple task descriptions and we don't know which one is the best? Well, the most straightforward thing to do is to have this entire pipeline here, not just once, but several times. So if we have, for example, three different um, task descriptions for one task, then we have this pipeline here not once, but three times. And what we do then is we want to somehow combine the knowledge of those three models, each of them being trained on its own task description. And we do so using something very similar to knowledge distillation. So we use unlabeled examples. We provide each of those models with the unlabeled examples. And we use their outputs, compute their average. And so we obtain soft labels for those unlabeled examples. And we can then use them to train a regular classifier. Uh, that's already uh, PET. Before we get to the fun part of looking at how well this actually works, um, there's one more thing, one more theoretical thing I'd like to discuss. Uh, when, we, when we came up with this idea, uh, it felt kind of unideal to, to approach our setting this way. Because we thought of each of those models as an annotator that has its own task description and uses it to uh, label our unlabeled data. But those annotators don't really get a chance to exchange information. Uh, they don't really get to learn from each other. And this is why we also invented a method that we call iterative pet or iPad for short, um, where basically we train multiple 
generations of models that learn from each other. So how does that work? Um, in iPad, we start just like before. We have a small set of training data. And if we have three different task descriptions, we train three models. We then use those models to annotate unlabeled data. And the crucial thing is that we generate an individual training set for each model. And this training set is obtained by using other models. So for example, we might use model two to annotate data for model one. We can use model three to annotate data for model two and use model one to annotate data for model three. There's some important details here, like how many examples and which examples do we annotate, um, but I'm not going to go into detail now. Um, you can read that up in one of our papers if you want. The key thing is that now we have bigger training sets with more examples. We can use them to retrain our models. And this, of course, also allows our models to exchange information. And we can do this not just once, but of course, we can repeat this multiple times. OK, so uh, now let's see how well this actually works. And first of all, before we compare to GPT-3, uh, we're going to look at just one data set, um, which is the Yelp full data set. And this data set is very si similar to the examples that we've already seen. So in this data set, you are given a review for a restaurant. And the task is to guess how many stars the reviewer has assigned to this restaurant, ranging from one to five. We use four different patterns, four different task descriptions as uh, shown on the left. So we have it was mask, just mask, all in all it was mask, and in summary the restaurant is mask. And we map one star to the word terrible, two stars to the word bad, and so on uh, until we get to grade, which we uh, five stars which we map to grade. I think some, uh, someone just raised their hand. If you have a question, feel free to ask. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, sorry for this interruption, uh, but uh, no actually, if you can, 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 uh, could you please go back uh, to your previous slides? Uh, yeah, this one, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can repeat this, uh, you know, exchange of the, the training set several times, as many as you like, but actually, I, I, I guess that uh, there must be some, some kind of um, converging threshold, right? Uh, how many times is useful to, to, to repeat this, this combination? Do you have some comments about that? Uh, I do, um, but I would wait for this because I think in three or four slides, we're going to go to Okay, okay. sorry then, I will wait. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. You. Perfect. Um, all right, so back to our task. Uh, this is the patterns and the verbalizer that we use for this Yelp full uh, data set. Now, before we look at PET, um, let's just look at two obvious baselines. Um, so we look at 10 training examples, which is very few, and we use a pre-trained Roberta large model. Uh, and the baselines we see here is accuracy if we perform supervised learning without using any patterns, any task descriptions, and unsupervised learning. That means we use the task descriptions, we use the patterns, but we perform no training at all. We don't use the examples. Um, this is a balanced data set, so random guessing would achieve an accuracy of 20%. So we can see that supervised learning doesn't work at all with 10 examples. And also unsupervised uh, learning isn't that great. Before we look at, a, at PAT as a whole, uh, let's see how well the best and worst patterns perform. Um, this is what can be seen here and here. So uh, even the worst pattern performs better than just unsupervised learning. But the best pattern is, again, much better than the worst one. And now the problem is in a few shot setting, we don't know which of our patterns is the worst one and which one is the best one. Uh, if you look at those four patterns again, at least for me, there's no way of telling uh, which of those patterns is the best one and which one is the worst one. And that's where our distillation strategy comes in. So let's see what happens if we just combine all of those patterns to train a single model. And the great thing is that we end up with a performance that is even better than just using the best pattern. So this really allows us to specify all the task descriptions, all the patterns that we can think of, combine all of them. And this simple mechanism is quite good at filtering out um, or reducing the impact of, of bad patterns. And things do even get better with this iterative variant. So with iPad, we achieve a score of 57.6. Now, a couple of more um, examples. I think we can go, go through the next ones very briefly. Uh, here's what happens if we increase the number of training examples. Uh, so we see that with pattern exploiting training, we get huge benefits for 10, 50, and 100 examples. With 1,000 examples, we don't really get much of a benefit 
anymore. And we can, of course, also compare to some more um, challenging baselines. For example, here uh, we compare to unsupervised data augmentation and mixed text. Uh, but I don't think we have to go into, into detail on that. All right, so let's get to the question that was uh, just asked. Um, how about iPad? How many generations of models do we actually need? And we actually look at iPad in a zero-shot setting, so in a setting where we don't have any training examples at all. And what we can see here, again, for our Yelp full task is the performance of supervised learning with 10, 100, and 1,000 examples. And we can also see the performance of an unsupervised model, which is called generation one here. Now, the beauty of iPad is that we can also use it in a fully unsupervised fashion. We can simply use those untrained models as our first generation. We can use them to annotate data. We can then train a second model and so on. And if we do this just once, we already get a huge performance boost to 48.2%. And if we repeat for more generations, scores just keep getting better. Now, actually, we didn't try what happens after five generations, uh, but you can also uh, already see that there is some saturation here. So I wouldn't expect scores to go up much more after this fifth generation. OK, so um, now let's get to the uh, second part of this talk, uh, in which we're going to compare PET to priming. Uh, everything that you've just seen is actually something that we've done in January of 2020, so even before GPT-3 uh, came out. And of course, when GPT-3 was released, there was quite a hype about few-shot learning and about their method. So back then we thought, well, um, let's see how well this actually performs and let's see how well our approach uh, performs in comparison to GPT-3 and priming. Before we get to this uh, comparison, let's quickly recap how GPT-3 works, how they do few-shot learning. The thing is that GPT-3 is such a big model that it is almost impossible to fine-tune. And if you do fine-tune, you end up with one, uh, 150, uh, no, 175 billion parameter model for each task, which is just very impractical. So what they do instead is they don't do any gradient-based learning. They just provide labeled examples as additional context. But apart from that, they use a similar idea of providing task descriptions. So for example, if we have just one labeled example and we want to find the correct output for this second example, um, they would just uh, add, those, uh, add this first example to the context uh, with the pattern filled in and would then process this entire uh, batch without any uh, fine tuning. Uh, there's two issues with priming. The first one I already uh, mentioned. It requires a gigantic language model to work well, so it's unusable in many real-world scenarios, uh, even if you had the capacity to train GPT-3 from uh, scratch, um, which is very, very expensive. And then, of course, priming also doesn't scale to more than a few examples because most pre-trained language models have context windows of only a few hundred or thousand tokens. So if you have 50 or more examples, uh, you can't use priming anymore. Before we get to our experiments, um, let's just quickly look at how big the models are that we look at. First of all, we're going to look at GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters. We're also looking at GPT-3 medium, which has just 350 million parameters. And the model that we use for PET is Albert XX large, which is again smaller than GPT-3 medium and has just 0.1% of GPT-3's parameters. We evaluate all of those models on superglue, which is a common um, benchmark in NLP uh, to measure uh, progress towards, I would say, human-like text understanding. And so um, without further ado, what we can see here are results for superglue trained with 32 examples. I don't think it's important to look at all those tasks in, in detail. So maybe let's just look at the last column here where we see the average performance of all uh, models. First thing we can see is that a, a GPT-3 model of similar size to Albert performs terribly. Uh, not much above random chance. Um, but the cool thing is that both PET and iPad even outperform GPT-3 uh, despite having um, much, much less parameters, despite being much smaller models, uh, simply because of this mechanism of how we combine task descriptions with learning from examples. Um, you might argue that this um, comparison is not entirely fair. 
um, because PET additionally requires unlabeled examples for this distillation step, which is of course something that GPT-3 does not have access to. So we can also look at how well PET performs if we don't have any unlabeled examples. In that case, we can't do our distillation step, but of course we can use our ensemble of models to perform classifications. So if you have three task descriptions, we simply use all three models, which is still much, much smaller than GPT-3, and we average their predictions for each test set examples. Um, and we can see performance here for a couple of tasks. So we compare regular PET to PET without any distillation. And again, if we just look at the average, we see that not performing distillation even slightly improves performance. So this basically means that we don't need unlabeled data for PET. It's just more practical because it allows us to distill all of those different task descriptions into one uh, single model. And then there's another thing um, that I think is highly interesting, and that is results for different sets of training examples. Because we've just been looking at one particular set of 32 training examples for each uh, task considered. Um, and so what we did is we also created two different data sets by sampling another set or two more sets of 32 training examples. Uh, and we, what we can see here is that in a few shot setting, uh, this really can make a huge difference. So it plays quite a crucial role which 32 examples we select. And for some tasks, we get much worse performance uh, with other training sets, but sometimes also better performance uh, than with the ones um, that we've used for our main results. I think this is quite an important result because future learning is now such a such a, a popular topic to, to work on. And yeah, I think this is really a, an issue that needs to be resolved and I don't really have any, any good approach for doing that. Of course, we can just repeat experiments 10 times using different different training seats. But I think the, the fundamental, uh, fundamental question here is, can we somehow identify in advance which examples are the most promising ones to train on. So I think this gives rise to some, some very interesting uh, future research. All right, um, that's already the uh, second part of this uh, talk. Let's just quickly uh, summarize uh, the difference between PET and, and priming or GPT-3. Uh, the cool thing about PET is it works uh, with small language models as well. Uh, you can even, even with just a single GPU, you can use it to, to train small language models in future settings. It also scales to more examples than fit into the context window. So you can easily use it with, let's say, uh, 100 or 1000 examples. Uh, and also it doesn't require a development set to optimize patterns, simply because if you can think of multiple patterns of multiple task descriptions, you can just combine all of them, you can throw all of them together and um, hope that the distillation mechanism uh, filters out the bad ones. On the other hand, PET does require fine tuning multiple models for each task. So unlike GPT-3, where you have just one model that you can in theory use to solve a broad range of different tasks, with our framework, you need a different model for each task, but as the models can be much, much smaller, um, I don't think it's that much of an issue. And um, another thing that isn't quite true anymore, but it was uh, true when I designed this slide here, is that PAD, uh, the way I've showed it to you, doesn't work for generative tasks. So we can use it to, to uh, perform text classification. But for example, if you want to do summarization, uh, we cannot use PAD for that. And so finally, before we get to the uh, last part of this talk, um, you can, of course, also give a pet a try yourself. You can train your own pet uh, using the URL shown here. Uh, we've tried to make this uh, library as, as simple as possible. So even without detailed knowledge of uh, pre-trained language models, if you're if you able to program some lines of Python code, uh, you should be able to use that for your own uh, tasks. All right, so um, finally, let's get to the last part of this talk, uh, which is going to be an outlook of some, some research directions that I find interesting for future work. Uh, we've already worked on, on some of them, so I'd just like to share a couple of thoughts on that. Um, in particular, I've got five topics in mind. 
Uh, the first one is finding patterns and verbalizers. How can we how can we do that? And then I'd also like to talk about generative pets. So how can we use this idea for text generation? Um, we're also going to look at something that I've been working on very recently, uh, something that we call data sets from instructions. Um, we're also going to look at task descriptions in, in, in more detail and some open research questions there. And finally, I'd like to talk about something that is not a direct extension of PET, but is related to this. Um, that's another recent work of ours, which we call self-diagnosis and self-debiasing. OK, so let's start with finding patterns and verbalizers. Um, this can be quite challenging. Um, for some tasks, it's quite easy to find good task descriptions, to find good patterns and verbalizers. For example, for this uh, Yelp review task, it's fairly easy. Um, but for other tasks, it's much, much more challenging. For example, if we think of the uh, the previous talk, um, I think for some of those tweet classification settings, it's much more difficult to come up with patterns and verbalizers that are understood well by pre-trained language models. So one very interesting uh, research area in, in my view is, can we somehow automate this process or can we at least aid humans in, in finding good patterns and verbalizers? Can we somehow take those patterns and verbalizers generated by humans and further improve them. Uh, we've already got some, uh, some work on that. Um, and there's also some work by other research groups uh, that, that tries to do just that, that tries to solve this particular problem. Uh, I've also got an example here of one of our methods where uh, we looked at a question classification data set. And we just tried to find verbalizers. So we tried to find natural language words that represent each possible label, each question category. And in this picture here, you can see the true categories uh, at, the, at the bottom and the categories found by our, our model at the, at the top. Um, so finding those verbalizers in an automated fashion is possible to some extent. If you're interested in that, you can uh, check out the paper linked at the, at the bottom. The second, uh, second thing I wanted to talk about is generative pet. So um, can we also approach, uh, can we also use this approach for text generation? Um, uh, the, the short answer is yes, we can. Um, I'm not going to go into details um, and maybe we can also skip this slide. But for example, if you want to do summarization, we can use patterns like short summary followed by a mask token and use this in combination with a pre-trained language model. And this results in quite good summarizations in a, in a few shot setting. Again, there are some important details. So if you're, if you're interested in that, um, you can check out the, the paper link below. Um, but then again, uh, for, for generative tasks, at least we found that small language models are not as good as the large ones, not as good as GPT-3, for example. So I think this is something that uh, deserves much more attention and where much further research um, is possible and would make sense. Uh, then I'd also like to quickly talk about something that I've been working on very recently, uh, something that we call data sets from instructions or Dino or Dino for, for short. Um, this is basically an extension of the, of the uh, pet idea uh, based on the fact that I recently got access to GPT-3 and I didn't know what exactly to do with that access. So um, a question that I, I had in mind back then was, can we somehow uh, use this, uh, this access to GPT-3 uh, and use that big model to generate entire data sets, for example, in a zero-shot setting, on which we can then train much smaller models? And so what we did is we uh, looked at a, a task where we tried to find out how similar two sentences are. And we used GPT-3 to simply generate a data set from scratch. So we use the uh, task descriptions shown on the on the left here. We ask GPT-3 to generate or to write two sentences that mean the same thing, to write two sentences that are somewhat similar, or to write two sentences that are on completely different topics. And then we collected all of those generated examples into a data set on which we can then train, of course, much smaller language models. Uh, I think this is another uh, exciting direction that, that one can further, further explore for exploiting those, uh, those large language models and distilling their knowledge into much smaller models, even if we don't have any training examples, even if we don't have any unlabeled examples, and we even don't have access to the model's uh, parameters. You can also play around with uh, this particular um, uh, model if you, if you want. I've uh, added the 
uh, link to the GitHub repository to this slide here. And then uh, one more thing before we get to the last um, future direction that I'd like to talk about. Uh, I've been using the word task description quite often during this talk. Uh, but of course, most of those patterns that we looked at aren't actually task descriptions. So I think it's a bit of a stretch if you just pretend um, the restaurant was mask, if you call that a task description. Um, and of course, there are tasks for which we require much more complex task descriptions. For example, uh, the description shown here is some, uh, some description that I've used in my industry job, uh, not for a pre-trained model, uh, but for actual human annotators. And the description for this particular task was carefully read the following incident ticket and corresponding work log entry. Does the work log entry provide a solution to the problem mentioned in the ticket? And this is a task description that can be understood quite well um, by humans. I think it's, it's uh, well, if, you, if you've seen a couple of examples, it's very easy to solve this task. But it's a task description that doesn't work at all for pre-trained language models, at least not for the ones that we've tried. And this shows that while pre-trained language models are able to, to solve those very simple kind of closed questions, to work with those short and simple and concise task descriptions, uh, they are far from human-like performance. And I think much, much more research is needed um, to actually make them work for task descriptions like this one and to actually make them work for, for many, many tasks that cannot be expressed in, in five or six words or so. And so this brings me to my uh, last slide. Um, this is something that I also wanted to quickly mention because it is related to, to pattern exploiting training. This is another line of research of ours where we also uh, kind of exploit the pre-trained uh, or the, the knowledge contained within pre-trained language models uh, by, by providing them with uh, task descriptions. But for this particular paper, we provided them with uh, descriptions to control their behavior uh, rather than uh, making them learn a particular task. So um, what this is about is um, one well-known issue with pre-trained language models is that if we train them on, them on millions of examples, uh, we must somehow find those examples. And typically, we do so using the internet. So um, what we do is we crawl thousands or millions or billions of texts, and then the model is trained to perform language modeling on those texts. And of course, texts in the internet are far from neutral. If you just look at some uh, comment columns or if you look at Reddit and so on, uh, you will find lots of biases uh, and lots of things that we wouldn't actually want in a language model. But of course, if you train a model on, on those texts, it is going to pick up the biases contained within those texts. And so this is shown in those four examples uh, on this slide here. For example, if you use a pre-trained T5 model and ask it to complete the phrase, I hate black blank so much, uh, then it outputs people, which is of course terrible. We don't want a model to, uh, to have those or produce those kinds of uh, thoughts. And also if you ask the model uh, this closed question at the bottom, all terrorists are closed, um, then it predicts Muslims, which again is, is a terrible prediction. And there's two more examples on the on the right. And so what we tried is we tried to provide the uh, model with um, instructions on how it should behave. So we explicitly told the model that it should not be racist, it should not be violent, it should not be sexist, and so on. And we did so using a very, very similar method to PET. So we just explained to the model how we wanted to behave in natural language with uh, some tricks involved. And uh, this also gave quite promising results. Of course, it doesn't solve this issue in any way, uh, but I think it's a, a cool direction for further research. Uh, so for example, if you tell the model to not be racist, instead of saying, I hate black people so much, it says, I hate black cats so much. Uh, and if we tell it not to be racist, uh, again, for the second example, instead of saying all terrorists are Muslim, it says all terrorists are bad. All right, so um, yeah, as I've said, this is just a quick summary of some of the uh, research topics that I currently find uh, interesting. I hope you found some of them uh, interesting as well. And uh, that's it already from my side. Thank you for listening. So I have a question, if there is a time for that. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this very nice talk. This You're welcome. Is very inspiring. Thanks. And uh, I have a question uh, going back to the 
But uh, why it is working? Do you have some mathematical explanation for that? Some some kind of proof? Mm, not not a mathematical uh, explanation, to be honest. But I think it intuitively uh, makes makes sense if you if you look at how the model is pre-trained. I mean, uh, during pre-training. Uh, if we if we if we pre-train on the entire internet, the model is going to see some reviews for restaurants. The model is going to see some summarizations. It's going to be some uh, see some examples of racist text and so on. So it's going to see all of those things, and basically pre-training. Um, it forces the model to do just what we want it to do. Um, it forces it to make educated guesses of a plausible, um, like uh, plausible um, substitutions for for masks, and so I think in, intuitively it makes sense that if we make the actual downstream task as similar as possible to pre-training, uh, this uh, this helps the model in understanding the task and solving the task. But I, I don't have any uh, mathematical proof or any any mathematical insights into into why this works well. I'm sorry. I see. So, so then I, let me continue with the second question then. <laughs> uh, let us assume that uh, you have your own uh, labels mm -hmm. and actually, for example, you have a very highly unstructured text and you have to, 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 to somehow classify this um, according to just using some 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 kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. And then do you think that this method will have a chance to be working if you have somehow, you know, um, <clears throat> already existing um, you like to 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 classify the, the the all sentences in your in your data set uh, according to your uh, ad hoc uh, categorization so for example let's assume that at the, at the beginning during the, the the first run you are introducing some uh, ad hoc labeling and then you are trying to to improve the, the accuracy of, of 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 classification do you have a do you see some chances? I'm, I'm not sure if I fully got that, but if I got it correctly, then yes, yes, absolutely. I think that's just the um, uh, that's exactly the the kind of setting that you that you would want to use this method for. If you if you have some some new task and uh, uh, you have some ad hoc labels and you are able to to come up with uh, with a good task description with a good pattern, um, then uh, yeah, this uh, is absolutely something that you that you should try. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, even in a zero shot setting, but of course, uh, if you have like ten or twenty labeled examples, you can uh, expect uh, even even better performance. I would say. But if I got your your question correctly, uh, this is exactly one of those settings where we try this method. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. You're welcome. Okay. We have a question uh, in the chat from Dieter. Uh, what the target language was, uh, and if you. Uh, uh, if it's just English, so I think generally um, you're using multilingual language models, right? So maybe you can give some insights into into how that scales to different languages. Absolutely. So um, I mean, one of the issues with this method is that you need a large pre-trained language model. So for for a language where you don't have those models, you 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 simply uh, will not be able to use it. Um, I do have a couple of um, of slides on that actually, so maybe we can just very briefly go through them. Um, we did lo look at just one um, multilingual task in our original uh, paper, and this is the X stance uh, task, which also only has very limited languages. I think it has German, French, and Italian. And we chose this particular task because I know all of those languages well enough to be able to come up with very, very simple patterns. Um, so for, for this particular task, let's just go through it very briefly. You are given a question and a comment. And the question or the, the task is to find out whether the person who wrote that comment agrees with the premise in the question. For example, should Switzerland strive for a free trade agreement with the USA? And then the comment is the free trade agreements jeopardize the quality of Swiss products. So in this case, the output would be negative. Whoever wrote this comment does not think that Switzerland should th uh, strive for a free trade uh, agreement. And for this task, we use some very, very simple patterns. We just use the question followed by a mask, followed by the comment. And as a verbalizer for English, we use no and yes, for a German nein und ja, for French non and we. Oui. And uh, we can see performance uh, here. So um, again, supervised performance uh, versus versus pet. 
And the cool thing for this task is simply because it is more and more, more difficult, more challenging. Uh, even if you have more than 1,000 examples, you still get huge boosts from using pattern exploiting training. So even with 4,000 examples, or even when you use the full data set, you still get some gains. And at least for those three languages, um, it also works quite well. And this is with a pre-trained XLMR model. But of course, all of those languages are very similar to, to English, uh, linguistically speaking. And we did not, unfortunately, try any other languages so far. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, we just get a we in chat, so that answers the questions. Uh, the question: Does anyone else have any more questions for Timo? Otherwise, I can. Uh, I have a, quite a few, but I'll, I'll start with the one that was interesting, I hope, is um, summarization and generative learning. Um, you've talked about um, giving it a task description of short summary colon, right? So a colon mm -hmm. with a short summary. Um, have you tried or what's your experience with extractive summarization? And um, right now we've seen lots of patterns with a single blank to fill right that would probably be a pattern with multiple blanks to fill so can you give some insight into that into the limitations or potential of your approach for that um yeah good good question so um for for summarization i mean we've just been using one mask but we've been using a generative model so a model that can of course produce multiple tokens for for this particular mask um we didn't try extractive summarization because I wouldn't uh, know of any any straightforward approach to do so. I mean, what you could do is you could uh, use this pattern short summary followed by a mask, and then you can compute, of course, the probability of each sentence in the original text given that given that the close question. Uh, that might be might be worth trying, but I don't have have any any. I did I didn't try that, so I don't have any experience with uh, uh, with that um i'm also not sure you, you've asked about having multiple masks i i don't really um think that this would be needed even for extractive summarization i mean you can just like um have this one mask and then uh, compute the probability of uh, each possible first sentence you can then like use that um in a, in a greedy fashion, for example, again, insert one mask, generate the next sentence, and so on, and uh, so on. But one example where we had to use multiple masks is this, um, I'll just go back to this slide here, um, the setting where we let the model generate entire data sets, uh, because there we need the model to generate a first sentence and a second sentence. So in, in, in this case, we would actually have two uh, mask tokens if we do that with a um, um, generative uh, language model. With the mask language model, so we've uh, yeah, but this is the only task um, that I'm aware of where we actually tried something where there is more than one mask in the input. Okay, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Hi, uh, this is Angus. Can I ask you? Um, um, you mentioned somewhere that you you will still get the same results even if you don't use the knowledge distillation or the unlabeled data set. You, you get better accuracy, but you still use it. Can you please reiterate it? I didn't get the point. You, you mean why we're still using it? Yeah. Um, the thing is um, that we, um, like if you have, for example, if you have five different task descriptions, mm -hmm. then the idea of PET is to first train one model for each task description. And then mm -hmm. the knowledge of all of those five models is distilled into a, uh, into a single model. Now, the problem is if we don't do that distillation, we don't have one model but we have five models so we have to keep all of those five models in memory and during test time whenever we want to classify something we need to call all of those five models so either it takes five times as long or we need five times as, as much uh, memory and this is just just very impractical so so that's the key reason for including this this distillation step um another reason is that in the in the first paper in in, in our first paper on pad uh, we actually also found the distillation step to be helpful so results here are kind of, uh, kind of uh, contradicting each other we actually assume to to have the same result on on superglue uh, but there apparently distillation uh, even slightly slightly hurts performance i don't have any intuition as to why this is the case. 
Uh, just an, another question mm -hmm. I was curious about. Uh, did you try uh, comparing the results with, let's say, some models which have long range memory, for example, like long former? Or? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we we did uh, we did try the long former. Uh, we also tried to use the long former for uh, for for pet, uh, mm -hmm. but results were really terrible with with that model. I don't know why because it's actually based on Roberta, so I would expect it to perform similarly. But for some reason, it really performed terribly, uh, both with uh, priming with like all thirty two examples in in the priming window, but also mm -hmm. with with pet. I I don't know why I haven't looked into the uh, uh, did you did you say long former? We used the long former. We didn't use the reformer. No, um, I mean, yeah, I said long former. I okay, yeah, perfect. That, yeah, I thought uh, there was some. I was wondering if it should work better because of the because it tries to uh, retain longer correlations, right? Yeah, I, I would have I would have hoped so too. But um, at least in our experiments, it performed so poorly that we didn't even include mm -hmm. it in the. Uh, in the in the paper, I I don't know why this is the case because if you look at the long former paper results, it it should, uh, but but then again they only look at those tasks where you really need the long context and mm -hmm. yeah I don't I don't know maybe it doesn't work that well for priming. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, we've got another question from Chet from Max. Um, a short question: on Generative models. Which models were used for these tasks? Just mask language models or GP2 style decoder models? Um, yeah, for the uh, I mean, we have we have several papers on on uh, generative models. Uh, so, for example, for the uh, one shown in the in the slide here, we did use uh, GPT two. But for the for the um, paper that I mentioned earlier, where we did try to do summarization, maybe I can just open it. Yeah, that 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 one here. Um, for this one, we did use a model that is called Pegasus, uh, which is a, a model from, I think, Google AI, um, which is a masked language model. It's one of those masked encoder-decoder language models similar to BART or T5, if you're familiar with them. And we use this particular model because it is a, a very, very strong uh, baseline for, for summarization because it is pre-trained in a way that resembles summarization very much. And so we thought that might be the most interesting model because um, even if you can improve uh, upon GPT-2, maybe it's not that interesting if it still performs worse than a model that is already pre-trained with, uh, with something similar to summarization. So we only focused on this model and showed that even for, even for this model, providing task descriptions still gives, uh, gives a huge boost in performance for future settings. I really have just a very basic understanding of natural language processing. However, I can't, um, like, either it's just really a summary of what you talked about or a stupid question. Um, aren't you simply averaging the errors that your single models do because the tasks might be ill-defined? Uh. I'm not sure I can can entirely follow that question. Yeah, so, but I, um, I guess that's, a, that's just a, a kind of a vocabulary problem um, because, um, like, I have the feeling like you have those five tasks or whatever, how many tasks, um, you train every single model with it, and sometimes the tasks might not be really applicable to the input that you have, and then you average the errors, and therefore you get a better prediction. So um, um, first of all, I don't know if, if this is just terminology, but we don't do five tasks at the same time. We always just consider, uh, consider one task. Uh, but what we do is we provide, for example, five different descriptions for this task. So if you just go go back a little bit uh, to... Yeah, 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 task description. So like, but you, like different formulation of the same task, like you have like the, yeah. Maybe I was too imprecise again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so, your question is whether this uh, kind of uh, distillation step here um, uh, simply um, averages the, or, or what? What exactly was the question there again? Like, like I have the feeling that the, like because we were asking for a mathematical um, like mm -hmm. the question before for a mathematical explanation why that performs well. Like my intuition would just be that all of them kind of perform equally bad on certain like on mm -hmm. certain examples. And then if you take more than two of them, that improves the result. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's as, as simple as that. Yeah, I think, yeah. but but I, 
uh, I understood that earlier question more um, with regards to why that general idea of providing task descriptions work works well. So I mean, even even each of those models in isolation works quite well. If we if we look at okay. the results um, uh, here, we see that uh, even if we just use a single pattern, we can get to a performance of fifty two point four. Um, no. So yeah, I, I guess for for the distillation part, you're absolutely correct. This is just like we, we perform averaging, and so um, this kind of kind of helps if if the models are strong on on, on different examples. Um, yeah, but I think the the more crucial aspect is of course the the kind of task description thing because um, if you look uh, if you look here again, uh, averaging uh, all of those results just performs slightly better uh, than using the best pattern. Uh, but of course, uh, the best pattern is typically unknown in a in a few shot setting. So this was our main motivation for using this uh, distillation step. Okay, then I just missed that the completion step is actually kind of new. Mm, As I said, okay. I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not in the field for me for me that is like just like like the, I guess that's the this this egg of Columbus phenomenon that you are like. Uh, why hasn't anybody thought about that before? <laughs> so, yeah. But but it's it's a great idea then. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so if there are no further questions, um, I'd like to thank you, Timo, very much on behalf of the organizers uh, for your presentation. That was very fascinating and, and inspiring. And thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I think for now we can switch over to either, I guess we're slowly moving towards the end of the evening, so we can either have a bit of discussion if, if people are still um, feeling up to it and have the energy. Um, otherwise, it was, um, yeah, it was lovely having you all here. And thanks for all your great questions from the audience.